Okay, good morning. My name is Rob Smith. I want to thank you all for being here today. It's 1030, so I'm going to get started so that we can get out of here by lunchtime. I do have a lot of information to cover, uh, so I'm going to rush through a whole bunch of it, except for the places where I'm moving too fast and I have to wait for the video to catch up. But uh, we're looking at design, calculation of fire sprinkler systems in Revit and uh, NFPA and other standards. My name is Rob Smith, and I have with me Mayank Sharma and Chandrakant Injanamuri. Chandra is the primary programmer for the Revit uh, processes that you're going to see. Chandra and I, I'm sorry, my, Mayank and I work together. He does special hazards, and I do the wet pipe, dry pipe fire sprinkler systems. Uh, and he's here helping me out, but as it turns out, I pretty much have all the buttons covered. So if I say something stupid, he's got instructions to stop me and say, no, no, don't do that. Okay. So me, I've been doing fire sprinklers for like 39 years. Uh, my unk just graduated. And uh, Chandra, I don't know how many years programming you've been doing. He's been working for Sprinkhead for like six years, I know. Okay, so what we're going to do. <clears throat> First thing I'm going to show you is a program called Sprint Code. It's known as Sprint Code Connect. It's a web-based platform that can be an assistant for understanding the density and coverage and uh, various requirements of NFPA 13 and EN 12 845 codes. It is a free service. Anybody can use that. I'll talk about that first. Just so you know, then when I get into two and three, it's pretty much just videos that I'm going to talk about as they go. Um, both parts two and part three involve licensed software. Uh, it's the SpringCAD software group. SpringCAD for Revit is the program. And it's not free. Uh, you require a license to do the things I'm going to be doing up here. So if that is a problem for anybody, I just want to let you know that right up in front. Number two is that even though we're talking about fire sprinkler design and calculations and all that, this is not a class that's intended to teach anything specific about fire protection calculations or design as much as I would like to. There's one little piece here that I'll do that you might say, oh, you know, okay, I glean something from that. But pretty much it's a demonstration of what this software can do competitively priced. I'm not going to go into that. And if you want to know more about the software, I've got business cards here. I'm happy to hand out when we're done. Okay, so in part two, we're going to go through the steps of performing a hydraulic calculation. The, the advantage is that the system can be drawn using anybody's tools, anybody's Revit-based tools, Revit right out of the box. You can draw a fire sprinkler system. If Revit thinks a fire, it's a fire sprinkler system, then we can calculate it. The calculation tool requires a Sprinkhead license, and then we're going to look at these additional tools. A family manager, which is used to create Revit families. You don't have to know anything about creating Revit families. You just have to know what it is that you want in that family. The program will create it for you, and it's usable within Revit with, again, with pretty much anybody's software. And some tools that we'll show for moving and connecting, connecting sprinklers to pipe, connecting pipe to pipe, moving things around etc. All right, so part one, free tool, it's available to your company. It can be used by many people in that company, but we want one company administrator. So if you are a member of a large group, pick out that one guy who's going to be the admin. He goes into our web page and signs up for their free account, and he, then he creates additional users. So we don't care how many users they create. And the person can actually create a whole bunch of administrators just as easily. Managers, there's like three levels. I'm an administrator, manager, a user. But bottom line is you go to this web page, www.sprintcode.com. And down in the bottom, you've got the user login section. And the admin requests access by clicking on the request access link. <clears throat> then you fill out this page which includes a business type and a name and address and the administrator's username and other information and password. So the administrator is going to create his own 
username and password. And then when you create n new individual users for your company, you create additional. So just in case you didn't catch it, only the company admin requests access. Don't everybody try to gain access. If you put in to the bottom here who referred you, referred by Rob Smith, that's me, then the people who do the approvals will know that you heard about it here at AU and you'll get a quick response on the approval. After you submit access, you've created a username and a password, it doesn't mean that they're going to work. They won't work until you get an email back from us saying you've been approved. All right, don't forget to click the little I accept and to hit the register button and then you go in. So now this screen assumes that an admin has created an account and he's created a user and he's created a project. So up on top, you've got this project that was created and then the user is going to create a new design area. So a design area within this software basically means I've got a name of an area, I called it Southeast Multipurpose Room based on the stuff I'm going to show you in part two. And the codes that are available to choose from, NFPA 13 going back to 2002 up to 2019, and we've just added the European EN 12845 code. So you pick a code and you pick a hazard. Now, because I picked NFPA 13 2019, that's the list of hazards that exist within that code. Whichever code you pick, you'll get a slightly different list of hazards, but then for every hazard, you have a list of commodities. This is probably the simplest of them, but it happens to be what I was demoing in, my, in this uh, school example. So I've got a light hazard com commercial commodity, and I've created this new area. You pick on that area, and then you click the search code button. So, so far we've got an admin who gained access, somebody set up a project, and now we've created this design area, we go into the code. There's a series of options that you specify, is it a wet or a dry system, is, are, are there hose stations involved, uh, does my ceiling height, well, I, sorry, it is what is my ceiling height, and I put in 10 based on the sample I'm running. Uh, does the ceiling pitch over 2 and 12, et cetera, et cetera. So you have these various options, and they're specific to the code, the hazard that you selected in those previous screens. So you might have 12 or 13 options here, like uh, for rack storage. Is it encapsulated or non-encapsulated, et cetera. Once you fill that in, you click the search button down here at the bottom, and you get a table of results. Those, these are a number of possible solutions as to how you could approach the design parameters of this particular uh, set of systems and options and conditions. You see across the top that there are two lines for standard spray quick response and then there's a couple of lines for extended coverage quick response. I happen to know that the design in the sample I got it's extended coverage, quick response. So I selected extended coverage, quick response, and when I do, watch the bottom half, the program fills in the details. What is the required density, the required square footage of the area, but what's the area adjustment? So based on the 10-foot ceiling, I've only got to cover a 900-square-foot remote area. These are upright heads, up, uprights and pendants are applicable to that. I require 100 gallons of total hose demand. And it's interesting, I can see it up there, but I can't see it over here. Uh, hose demand requirement, the duration of your water supply, and the maximum square footage of coverage for uh, a system in that. And then down here in the bottom section, you've got a list of code references. So you've got paragraphs, tables, etc., along with a brief description, it's a paraphrased description over here of what that code reference and what that table tells you about your results here. And you can actually go down through the different selections, including ESFRs and control mode specific application, and, and take a look at your details and your references if you want to do some research there. Okay, so once you've chosen the approach you're going to take, if you hit the show report button down here, then you get a printable PDF that is a summary of basically everything that you've done so far. 
it shows you the project information, the conditions that you selected, and the, the summary, which was the top half of that table on the right, followed by the references. All, and, and this was a two-pager. I am only showing you the first page. All right. So that is the free part. Sprint Code Connect, www.sprintcode.com. All right, so now going into part two. I have no idea whether I'm on time or behind, but the rest of this is, is movies, so. All right, so we're gonna launch Revit. We're gonna figure out what sprinkler heads we wanna calculate. Then I'm gonna create a design area, which is essentially a, a placeholder for my density and some other information. I'm gonna create some job information, which is the kind of thing that would be in your uh, Revit project information, but we don't yet read directly from Revit project information. So I, I expect that will be coming before very long. And then what's important here is that we create a source point and identify the flowing nodes. Flowing nodes could be sprinklers, they can be hoses, they could be standpipe outlets, they could be fire, uh, fire hydrants if you're doing like a fire flow analysis. Then we have to map the components and run the cal. So here we go. I'm launching Revit and uh, hopefully I'll be in sync here. Revit comes up. This is like a, a fast version of what I did. I picked this school. This is a this is a school that was designed by somebody else as part of a training class. They gave me this uh, model to work with. Thank you. And uh, what I've done here is I'm going to look inside. So I'm doing something I was told I'm not supposed to do, which is to hide in view. Apparently, that's not a good Revit technique. But I'm a fire sprinkler guy. What do I know about Revit, right? And I mean that in all sincerity because I am a Revit beginner. Uh, in my opinion, most fire sprinkle people have been dragged into Revit. All right, so this is a uh, plan view, and I'm zooming into this uh, bottom right corner or the southeast corner of the building where I have some branch lines. And that's this area here. You see the branch lines. This is like a tree. Up here we have a source point. And then all of this out here is essentially one giant loop. It's been split on this leg, split on that leg, split, split, but it's a great big loop. And then off the end here is a, is a tree extension. So I'm choosing to calculate this tree as a first step. Obviously, you'd probably perform at least two calculations on a floor like this because you've got to deal with that looped. Uh, it's, it's more loop than grid, but you'd have to calculate that as well. Okay, so I've decided that this is the area I want to calculate, and I'm doing some investigation here. Uh, looking at the drop nipple, which is one inch, the branch line, which is inch and a quarter. I happen to notice that it's copper down here, inch and a quarter copper. Going in for a closer look, I was trying to get a look at the sprinkler head, but I feel like I keep getting the drop nipple. One inch copper drop. So this whole thing was designed in copper, <clears throat> which means whatever company got the contract is just floating in cash, right? Floating in cash. All right, so this is the system in a 3D view. Again, copper, one inch drops. Now I'm gonna take a look at the sprinkler head. And that is a Viking head. So obviously the designer has no class either. But uh, Viking head, sorry, that was, a, that was an inside joke. Uh, no, no heckling, no heckling. Okay, so what I wanna do now is I wanna apply this concept. I know that I need 900 square feet of coverage. So I'm using something in Revit called a region. I just barely learned how to do this and I'm probably doing it wrong. I create a Revit region that starts down here in the corner. I'm gonna stretch out a line and I know 900 square feet, square root of that is 30 feet times 1.2 square root multiplier is 36 feet. And I see that halfway between the second and the third head is about 31 feet. So I pull out to about 36, which is my minimum, and I see uh, I need three heads in this branch line to be included. So I'm gonna pick a point out here. I'm eyeballing. If there's a way to snap to the middle of things, I'd love to know how to do it, because I don't know. Then I drag out, this is about 20 feet, as I see here as I'm dragging this. I'm thinking, okay, there's uh, 45 by 20, or is actually more like 49 by 20. It's about 1,000 square feet. I'm gonna pick a point here eventually. 
unless I stop the movie accidentally. Nope, there it goes. Back to the wall, close the region, and then I'm going to investigate the properties of the region. So I'm going to finish the region. There it is. I select it. And right up here, you can see that I've got 955 square feet. So I've convinced myself that these six sprinklers on these two branch lines qualify as a design area. Back in the spring code section, I saw that I needed five heads as a minimum. I've got six flowing, so I feel like, okay, this is an acceptable design area. This is what I'm going to calculate. But then I click off and everything disappeared. And I thought, oh, what have I done? So I figured out, it took me a little while, that if I modify this object, and I did it by element, uh, which is probably wrong again, I basically changed the transparency of this region down to like 95%. Again, if there's a better way, you know, send me an email. I'd love to know. Because I, I am a real beginner at Revit. All right, so now I can see through my region. I can see the heads I want. And I'm going to zoom back out. I have no recollection of what I did next, so we're going to all wait together while I create a design area. All right, so creating a design area, I have to log in. This is where the licensing comes into play. By the way, the licensing is, is uh, internet-based, but you can also have a license that lives on your computer for like up to a couple of weeks in case you're traveling like I am. Uh, anybody can use that license. You know, it's network licensing. All right, so I've, I've filled in this design area with a location name, whether it's a wet or a dry calculation. It's a demand style calc. We do supply and demand calcs. Hayes and Williams versus Darcy Weisbach. And uh, the engine is Sprinkhead, and I've put in 100 gallons of outside hose, uh, 900 square feet, and a note that this is a demo calc. So I click OK, yonder. And I now have one design area created. So all that really did in the long run is it established the density for my design area. Now I'm in the job information. So I'm going to basically fill in, and I already filled it in just to make it short. The name and address of the job, the name and address of the contractor, all that good stuff. That's going to show up on my cover sheet. Again, before very long, I expect that we'll suck this information in from the Revit project settings, and Chandra's writing that down right now as we speak. How do I do that? Okay. If it can be done, he can do it. All right. <clears throat> Back into a 3D view. I'm zooming in over here on the supply. So what I've got in this location is a couple of uh, valves coming off a manifold fed by a pipe that comes in. One of the requirements of our supply node is that it lives on a fitting. So I'm going to highlight this pipe, and I'm going to use a Revit tool, cap open ends. I think I gave myself time to talk about the fact that I want my source on a fitting. I cap open ends, and now there's a cap out there. Whatever kind of cap Revit wanted to give me for this copper pipe. Very expensive cap, six inch copper. And now I'm going to add a supply node. So up comes my insert supply. We, we use a prefix followed by a number for pretty much everything. So if I had multiple sources, the first one will be SRC1, the second one could be SRC2. You can name it W1, W2, you can just name them 1, 2, 3. I've got the date of the test, the location, the source of the information as to who gave me that water flow information. Then there's a section here for uh, adjusting for a tank. By pressure or by elevation, I can make adjustments. Uh, to my source based on the tank information. I've got a section down here that is specifically about uh, using a pump curve as a supply point. But any curve can be inserted down here in this bottom section. And what I've got is 120 pounds static and 80 pounds at 750 GPM. And I just want to make sure that that movie is still running. I always worry that I accidentally canceled it. It may be the case, because I don't remember thinking about talking about sources quite this long, but, and the mouse isn't moving. Yeah, bummer. All right, give me a second. Is 
See, that's the problem with the split screen is I can't really control this movie from here. And you don't want to see all that again. But I don't know how to stop it. This is where I need the tech guy to come running in here and say, no, just do this. Anybody? All right, well, now I don't want to leave that part out. Let's, I've got to somehow figure out how to get back to that. This is what they warned me about. They said, you know, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. So I'll tell you what we'll do. Extend. You know? I see my notes. That's the problem. Because I need to... I need to duplicate the slideshow. There we go. You seeing that? Okay. All right. There that is, there that is, and here we go. All right, so I've picked my source, I filled in my tank adjustments. Well, I don't have any tank adjustments. I filled in my source flow data, and now I'm waiting for the mo movie to catch up to the part where I click OK. Trust me, it's coming. And I guarantee you the weight is killing me way more than it's killing you. Come on. It's funny because I ran this through live and then I chopped up bits and pieces, tried to leave myself enough room to talk about the various places. <clears throat> but apparently I thought I had a whole lot to say about supply nodes. All right, any second now. There it is. All right, so... What I did is I touched the cap and it became SRC1. And that source information gets embedded into that cap. Now I'm zooming back out and I'm gonna go over here where the fire sprinklers are. I said I wanted three heads on the last two branch lines. So I drop this down, I go to add a sprinkler reference node. In the same way, I've got a prefix and a number. This is, I'm gonna start with S1. They're overhead sprinklers. Overhead sprinklers uh, as shown up here, as opposed to in racks, the program will will track whether your GPM flow is overhead or in rack. And then uh, the design area name, the sprinkler coverage, the minimum pressure, and there's a space here for density override. Density override is only used if you have a sprinkler that's operating at a higher density than the rest of the design area. But I've, I've set the design area up to flow at a 0.1. The sprinkler heads are at 324 because I looked at the layout that I was given and the heads are spaced out at 18 by 18. So that 324 square feet is an actual hydraulic coverage, not a floor area. In case that's uh, new information to you, you could ask me about that later. All right, so I'm picking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, S4. And you notice these notes show up here in whatever view you happen to be in. ISO view, plan view, section views, you name it. The notes are gonna show up facing you, but they're temporary notes. And for like once, I actually saved my Revit project. Does anybody just live on the edge and never save their project? That's usually me. Okay. So now I'm about to run this calc. <clears throat> when I click on the run calc, the program asks me to pick a pipe. It wants me to pick any pipe that's in the system. Now there's some pipe out here over this way. This stuff is not in the system. It was part of a future extension or who knows what that the engineer was working on. I pick any piece of pipe in this system that runs between the design area and the riser and that piping all goes blue and I get the option to either say yes, that's it, run the calc or no, there's more pipe that needs to be connected or cancel, which means, oops, didn't really want to run a calc right now, let me, let me cancel out. I, I want to point out that when you use the run calc option, it, 
it needs to be a completed system, it needs to be connected. If you have disjointed pieces that aren't connected, you can use this option up here called Send to Sprint Calc, where you can fill in the blanks within our calc environment. But this thing, uh, I said yes, go, and so now I get to this mapping. So the, the purpose of mapping is to give our calculation engine very specific data out of my database about the pipes, the sprinklers, the valves, the pumps. So I'm only gonna map one pipe and then I'm gonna magically have it appear all mapped. I'm gonna map one sprinkler head and again, everything will magically be done. Um, but if you're working in a project, you only have to map an item once and the program remembers. Oh, whenever you see four inch copper, I really wanna use four inch schedule 10. Uh, I want galvanized, I want, you know, uh, domestic versus imported or whatever. But the bottom line is it's schedule 10 black pipe, which I chose by going through a series of options in this database. I'll be a little more specific about it when I do the sprinkler head. Because when you go to the mapping environment, it brings up this view of the database and we have filters on the left and an available list of parts that match those filters on the right. And as I said, once it's mapped, it'll stick. If you want to change it, the program always stops at this screen to let you change it. So here I'm going to pick extended coverage, which is hiding right up here. I know that those were extended coverage heads. And once I click that, then a number of the other things in this list will disappear. Now I know that it's a pendant head. And I knew that they were 11.2 K factor heads and I know that they were three quarter inch threads. So now I get from my database this list of three quarter inch extended coverage pendants with an 11.2 K factor. I pick one based on the finish and the temperature rating and I say okay. And then like I said, magically everything's been filled in. You can add your own product into this database. We don't stop you from putting anybody's heads in the database. Now the calc is running your own valves, your own sprinklers, your own pumps, your own pipe, whatever you want to add to the database you can add. All right, and that is basically the running of the calculation. The next section that I get to talks about those results. So this is where we left off. Zoom in a little bit here. And in addition to this graph, the next thing I'm gonna jump on is this diagram. But across the top are the results of the calc. Over here are some very I should say over here are some very specific, specific uh, results showing that you can look at the system from various angles. This is the same system, but only the pipes that got brought into the calc engine. Now I'm showing that you can review your hydraulics in this view by pulling up these pipe labels. You can choose from things like the flow, the material, the friction losses, the velocities, all this information that you can see within the pipe so that you can determine, you know, do my pipe sizes work? Do I want to make any changes? Of course, that would be based on information over here. I've got a 30-some pound surplus on this system so, uh, using Schedule 10 and Schedule 40 pipe. Uh, I'm not that worried about my surplus at this point. Here's a view of the sizes of the pipe. And of course, you can see by the wild actions of the mouse on screen that I was really working hard. All right, same way with nodes. I can look at the discharge coming out of these hydraulic nodes. I can look at over discharge. I can look at pressure total, pressure elevation. Any kind of information that you might want to identify problem areas, uh, things that you can modify in the calculation, you can see right here. I will point out that our methodology is you draw it, you calc it, and if you want to make a change, go back to the drawing and make your changes there. We don't allow you to make uh, changes in the calculation interface because then you'd have to go back to the drawing and make sure that they match up. We want to make sure that what you've drawn and what you get in your calcs match. Now I'm showing you the results. This is a printable file. It can be saved as a PDF, it can be sent to a printer. It's the same basic information presented as a report. Hydraulic analysis, uh, including the water supply. Uh, you've got your 
hose data being surmised down here. You've got the sprinkler flows being shown down here. And I think I just accidentally paused it again. And then any other flows that might occur, or you've got information like the required pressure at the source and the flow at the source. There's the water curve that we saw in the first result. Here's the curve intersection showing safety margins. And then there's this open heads table. Uh, I find this very, very helpful. I can look at the sprinklers to see what that I set for their coverage and their K factor. What was the required density flow and pressure? And then on the other side, I have the actual. This is the node header that's defined by NFPA 13. And this is the pipe header that's defined by NFPA 13, essentially. And we use a pathing style report where every piece of pipe in your calculation is represented at some point in the pathing report, but only the most important information shows up in path number one. If you've ever done hand calcs, you're very familiar with pathing style report. That's what a hand calc is normally done. You'll notice that we've got the NFPA fittings here. Uh, if I can see it as we go zooming past it, you'll notice the valve. Yeah, well, there it went. Maximum velocity is shown and the curves of the valves are shown at the bottom of the report. And the report is customizable. What information you want to see is all in there. Uh, let's see. Last thing I do is looks like, did I repeat? No. Okay. Now I've returned to, now I've returned to Revit. We show you the list of result, results as you come back into Revit. The, the pressures and flows at various uh, places like the base of the riser, the source, additional flows based on uh, outside hose, total flow, required pressure, available pressure, surplus pressure is all listed right over here. And then the node list. So not only the flowing nodes, but all of the reference nodes. And if you highlight one, it'll show up in your model. If you hit the zoom button down in the bottom, it'll take you right to that node. So the program is dropped onto the Revit fittings, the sprinkler node numbers, only at those locations where a node number is required per NFPA 13 or by any other code. Wherever water is added, splits, pipe size change, material change, all of those places you have to have a reference node because they show up in your hydraulics. So here I'm adding reference nodes to the drawing that will be more visible, more plottable, if you will, that match what was in my hydraulic calculation. So I set the offsets, the size, and there's a checkbox here that says remove those existing notes that I inserted when I first placed these things. Uh, as soon as I do that, I get these reference nodes that you see here. So there's S1, the sprinkler, and N477 was a required node where the one inch changed to inch and a quarter. Over at the next sprinkler, we'll see S2, and we'll see another reference node because the water was joined. Even though this is all inch and a quarter, we added water at node N487. Likewise, at the end of the branch line, we have a pipe size change. At the next branch line, we've got, uh, so there's my pipe size change, 473. There's my water being added on the cross main at 456, et cetera. So all those reference nodes are dropped onto your drawing. You can go to various views, section views or whatever, and insert those reference nodes. In case you want to do some printing in an ISO or a 3D view, just set your view. You go to run that same command. So I'm going to pick the sprint head toolbar. I'm going to ask for reference nodes, and I'm going to get a message. Hey, you need to lock the view before I can place these nodes. So I go down, now being the Revit expert that I am, and I save the view, and I lock it, and I run the command again. Of course, this is all running at six times normal speed because I'm exceptionally slow. Well, maybe not that bad. All right, I click OK. In come the nodes. And as you can see, now from this view, there's S1, S2, S3, et cetera and the same node numbers. Some of them are going to land on top of things. That's OK. They're basically reference tags that you can drag wherever you need them, wherever it looks good. All right. I believe that is the end of section two. So do a time check. I'd have you like get up and stretch and stuff like that, but then you 
give me bad reviews. All right, this one really runs fast. So these are these additional tools. These are like reference tools. Uh, the family manager I mentioned helps you build family content. There's a jog around, an auto branch, place sprinklers along a pipe, connect pipes to other pipes, and rotate and move things. All right, so, and this is really short. I wish I could show more of uh, these tools, but, you know, with only an hour. All right, so I'm going into the family manager here. <clears throat> As you can see, I can build sprinklers, fittings, pipe, mechanical and welded outlets. We can build hangers, valves, pumps, flow switches. I'm going to demonstrate with sprinklers. So I click on sprinklers. I click new family. And again, I have a, an abbreviated view of my database. Again, you can have anybody's content in this database. In fact, I would encourage you to contact your favorite manufacturer and say, hey, provide content to Sprinkhead so I can have your stuff in my database. I'm going through, I've picked a pendant head, I've got models, so this is an interactive filtering system. I'm going to pick an, ES, uh, an ELO 231. I'm going to pick a few sprinklers. Now, only the ones that I add to the bottom half of the screen are actually going to be placed in this family. So I'm giving it a different name, RS Sprinkler Pendant. I've added those to the bottom, and I click OK, and then I click Load. So what that does is it builds the family, and it loads it into my database, uh, pardon me, into my Revit model. You also have the ability, because the family is built and saved, you can check out where is it by doing a right mouse click, and you'll see this open folder in File Explorer. So I've got families now sitting in this folder that I can go use in any project, whether they're fittings, pumps, you name it. All right, the jog around tool. So over on the right hand side, there is a pipe. It is a sloping pipe. The pipe slopes at 2 and 12 in this case. And what I'm going to do is introduce an offset. I'm going to roll an offset through this pipe. If you've ever done something like this in Revit, dealing with sloping pipe, you know this can be a difficult task. But all I need to do is identify for the program what the offset angle is and what the distance is. So again, I've got a, a, an angle and a distance. Anything I put in the top two sections is going to impact the numbers that I see in the bottom section. As I make changes up here, the bottom changes. Or if you know an exact vertical and horizontal offset, you just plug in the numbers you want and let the program calculate the angles and the distance. You don't care what these are as long as I go up four inches and, and you know, left nine inches, et cetera. Whatever you fill in here then, you can either pick a start and an end point for your offset, so you just pick two points along that pipe, or you can specify, I want to go start two feet away from the end of the pipe and then do a, a four foot offset. Uh, this is written for sprinkler people, so everything thinks in terms of center to center. Revit has a tendency to look at the length of a pipe. Oh, it's a four foot long piece of pipe, but, but what's the distance between those two elbows? Sprinkcat is thinking in terms of two feet from the end of the pipe to the center of the offset. I roll out and I roll back. Now I'm going to do the specified distance, make some small change. If I use a negative number, then I can force it to go down and under things. Um, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the math. The program's doing the calc for me, and the little clock face in the top left is just showing me direction. And that's based on the way I'm looking at the pipe that I'm touching. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna break a pipe from this end and I say go that way, then it's gonna roll out counterclockwise based on the end of the pipe that I picked. And eventually I'm gonna click OK. So it's very very important to point out two feet, four feet, then click OK. All right, so I'm picking over here. So the program's gonna run from the center of that first offset. So the distance between those two offset pipes is actually two feet along the slope. Then we got a four foot offset and then we return back into the original pipe. So I'm gonna take a look at this from the side. Very proud of myself here. I figured out how to do sections in Revit. Thank you. You don't know what a big achievement that was for a guy who knows AutoCAD for 30 some years and uh, has to learn how to do Revit. So you can see it's a sloping pipe, it's running up away from me. 
and the things are leaning out to the left and the right. There it is in a uh, shadow view, I think it is, and then here's a shaded view. All right, sprinklers on pipe. This one runs by really fast. There's a whole bunch of information to cover in this dialogue, but the bottom line is I pick a family, I pick a type from the family, I specify how far away from the end of the pipe and how often I want those sprinklers to appear. And Revit likes to draw, if you're doing like a riser nipple or out of a sprinkler head, Revit will give you a half inch nipple coming up out of that sprinkler or a three quarter inch nipple. But we actually allow you to specify, and that's done right over here if I can get there in time. We let you specify the pipe type that you want. That comes out of your Revit list of pipe types, the diameter of the pipe that you want. And if you say I want a one inch sprig, you're going to get a one inch sprig, not the half inch or three quarter inch pipe that you then have to go back and modify. Now I'm going to do another section here and you'll see that it was a sloping pipe and the program understands the concepts of I need things to be at 90 degree angles. So there's my sloping pipe, there's my uh, T's and my little sprigs up to sprinkler heads at 90 degree angles automatically. The auto branch is a powerful tool that lets you grab a range of sprinkler heads and connect them in using branch lines, multiple branch lines, back to your cross main, we'll call it. So in this view, I've got two options. I've got an AB or an ABC. The difference is this one has that extra rise nipple, what we call an up over down, perhaps. This is just a straight arm, arm over and a drop, whereas this has the little extra rise. I'm able to pick for each of these pipe segments. Again, segment A, Revit would give you half inch nipple. I'm able to specify the pipe type and the size for both segment A and right now I'm doing segment B. If I had chosen the three pipe solution here, I would also fill in segment B down in this area. Now the branch pipe is the pipe that's going to connect all of these arm overs back to my cross main. So I'm able to specify what pipe, type, and size I want here. And although you won't see it because I go past it so fast, I've got threaded connections at the top of the nipple. I've got a welded outlet where the branch line meets the arm over. And I've got mechanical tees coming in on the cross main, all being done automatically. This piece here lets you specify minimum and maximum arm over lengths in order to modify your layout. You can flip things over if you don't like the way it's laid them out. Once you click OK, it draws it. And this is a piece I wish I had more time to cover. But there it is in plan view, and I think you'll get a really brief look at uh, an isometric view. And like I said, that included mechanical crosses coming in, welded outlets coming in, uh, threaded pipe where I wanted threaded pipe. This cross main I'm going to turn into a sloping main by modifying the elevation. Took me a while to figure that one out too. <clears throat> and obviously you can see it took me a while to do it. All right, so I changed the elevation on the ends of my pipe. Now I've got a sloping cross main. Sprinkler heads are out there, pretty much the same layout as I had before. I'm going to run the Sprinkhead auto branch and the differences I'm going to incorporate here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to an ABC. If you wanted to go down over and down as is sometimes the case in a system where you're doing like a swing joint to your sprinkler heads in the ceiling. I want to drop down to one foot above the ceiling then go over and drop. That's very easy to do here because one of the settings is the segment B vertical offset. I'm telling the program that I want this arm over to be one foot above the pipe or the branch line. If I set it relative to the sprinkler here, then I'd basically be saying I'm going to come up a foot out of the sprinkler, then hover, head over to where the branch line is, and then whatever the distance is that takes me to get up there or down, in some cases, that's what I need for my segment C. Then. There's a section here for the branch line pipe. And there I am talking about the segment B vertical offset. All right. So I actually got out ahead of the movie for once. The branch pipe also 
because I'm going to change an elevation right here, branch pipe elevation. Before the branches had an elevation change of zero, which means I got T's and crosses where I hit the cross main. Now I'm going to introduce an elevation change where the branch line meets the cross main. And because I'm able to do that back at the cross main, then the program wants to know, well, what kind of pipe are you going to use to connect your branch line to the cross main? Basically, I'm defining my riser nipples right down here. So I'll actually get there eventually. I never thought I'd get ahead of this thing because when I was practicing, I could barely keep up. See, that's what happens when you pop a few uh, whites before you run in. No, I'm just kidding. I was talking about white mints, little white dinner mints. All right, there it goes. Branch line elevation, I'm setting it to one foot. You can set that elevation relative to the main or relative to the main pipe's level. So like if I knew that my, my main was sloping through here, um, but, it, well, I guess, yeah, the main pipe level might be, uh, you know, the first floor, the second floor. And I can say, well, I want these branches to be 12 feet above the second floor. So then I'd have varying lengths of riser nipples to get me from the 12-foot branch line to whatever the main happened to be at that particular point at the tie-in. It's all possible in here. All right, grabbing the sprinkler heads, grabbing the cross main. Program gives me some options. I think I'm going to flip these. Uh, you can play with the min and max arm over length. It makes a, an incredible difference. But until you hit the OK button, nothing is permanent. But as soon as you hit OK, it draws it, drops it onto the screen. And it says, do you want to do some more? Basically, you can do multiple ranges of piping and heads in that command. But I hit cancel, which means stop the command. So there's my, oops, very quickly passed over, 3D view of the up over downs. Now I'm going to look at it from the side so you can see that the cross main was sloping. Each branch line is about a foot above the, well, I say about, is a foot above the cross main. And all of these arm overs that feed the sprinklers on the left and the right are a foot above those branch lines. So the arm over elevations change. All right, sprinklers to pipe. This is a simpler command, uh, but one of the things it offers is the ability to use flex pipe. And you'll see the pictures change. I can use flex hose to get from the sprinkler back up to the branch line. And we provide an A, a B, and a C version, which basically means no hard pipe, an arm over, or a rise, an arm over, and then followed by a sprig. So even though these were upright heads, I ran it this way, and you can see how I've got flex pipe from the end of the hard pipe. And moving right along, pipe to pipe. Okay, so on the right-hand side, let's see. I'm going to try and, I'm going to draw your attention to what's over here for a moment while I'm setting this up. I'm basically saying to the program, if the branch line is coming toward the cross main, they're at different elevations. I want a 90. Now, all of these pipes are sloping. The so-called cross main here is sloping. These branch line pieces are sloping. All of these guys are, oh, this last one isn't sloping. These two cross over the top, and these two fall short. So these two on the left are going to get a 90, and the two on the right are going to get a T up at the top. And then at the bottom, or where anything connects to the main, I can specify specific fittings, T's, taps, out of my list of Revit fittings, or I can say, just use the routing preferences. So you can get very specific and say, I want a mechanical T right here. I want this mo model of mechanical T when this pipe meets this pipe, bang. And it'll give you exactly that fitting because you've specified the fitting that you want. Whether it's a mechanical T, a welded outlet, and then I'm going to do an ISO view, and you'll see what was created there. So one was pitching high, the other was pitching low. This one was going under. Both of them got 90s as they tied in with a T. And then over, uh, hiding over here under the view cube, I've got a sloping riser nipple, because this was a sloping branch line, that was a sloping main. That riser nipple slopes to meet both of them at 90 degrees, which is you know, obviously very important in our industry. And there it is, 
Uh, from the side view, you can see the sloping main coming up through here. Yeah, well, you saw it. Now, 45 degrees. So the basic difference here is I'm going to say, when I come in diving in to hit that main, I need 45s, not 90s, for whatever reason. Tight tolerance, uh, preference for 45s. There's a whole bunch of them out in the shop, and they said, burn them up. So I pick the pipes, I pick my main. You notice I'm running this in an ISO view in a uh, full shade mode. It doesn't really matter what view mode you're in. And I get 45s diving in to the main. And if you've ever done the math on a sloping pipe, two sloping pipes, and try to come in and hit a 45 degree angle on the way in to meet everybody at 90s and stay on the 90 degree, that is no easy feat. And my congratulations to John here, because we described it for him and he nailed it down. All right, this is a move command. Now what's interesting here is that when I move these things, the stuff that gets moved, there's a, there's a 90 degree elbow right here. The stuff that gets moved, oh, I'm sorry, this is rotate. <clears throat> it's still impressive. All right, I'm gonna pick this piece of pipe over here as my axis of rotation. And then I get this dialog pop up that says, okay, what's your increment? I want to rotate in 45 degree increments, counterclockwise, clockwise, whichever way you want to go. No, I want to do 30 degree increments and bang, bang, bang. And it's just rotating all of those elements around the prescribed axis. Um, I've, I've used this command to do some really strange adjustments. Now this is the move, and the move command incorporates the rotate as well. But what I'm going to do is take that system, the whole system, and from this end point right here, I'm going to move it onto this elbow right here. So the elbow has one open end. So I'm literally going to take that whole thing and swing it over and connect it to that elbow. Now how often you want to do that, I don't know, but you might draw something simple and then say, now I want to take this concept layout and I want to connect it to that thing over there that's sloping at a pitch that you've prescribed. Bang, it'll kick, put it right into place. It just lines them up based on the axes of the target and the source. And then it gives you the opportunity to rotate things on top uh, based on the new location. So I'm talking about it and I'm rotating things. Click, click, click. Now, I don't know how often a person has to do exactly this, but I can definitely tell you when you're dealing with sloping pipe, this is not an easy job in Revit. And that was the reason that these particular set of commands were created, because we were trying to work in Revit and finding things somewhat difficult based on the limited knowledge of a guy that's been doing AutoCAD for 30 years. And I believe that is the end of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm back to the family manager. We don't want to do that. So here's our recap. Sprinkled Connect, the free tool that helps you understand NFPA and EN12845. Looked at running calculations, setting them up, running them, getting the reports based on an NFPA prescribed outlet. And then we looked at these tools, family manager and the jog, auto branch, sprinks on pipe, etc. If you have any questions, feel free to speak to any of us here in the sh speaker shirts. And, uh, yes. Yes, the question is, is there a way to modify the curve for a fire pump? The fire pumps that are in the database can be chosen and they'll come in as a template of a curved data points, but you can manipulate those data points any way you want. You don't even have to grab the pump from the database. You can go straight into that section where the curved data points are, just clear whatever is in there, and add, add pairs of data. This pressure at this flow, add. This pressure at this flow, add. So any curve, any pump, you can plug it right in. It, it, it can exist at the source. So a source could be a vertical turbine, a source could be an inline. You could even create a pump that sits between a source point and the rest of the system, so it becomes a boost pump, as opposed to a source pump. Either way works. Yes? 
are are we able to um, uh, to go and specify uh, like maximum velocities um, that are picked up uh, in the calculation? You cannot specify a maximum, but you can easily review the velocities. And in the printed report, you can create a specialized print template that just sorts by velocity, so you can immediately see what the max velocity is. In fact, even the standard output report that we say matches an NFPA layout, one of the last pieces of information in the piping section is the maximum velocity. So you just slide to the bottom of that, you see the max velocity. Um, because we don't auto-size anything, you know, we let you review your calcs and go out and make your changes. Okay, so you don't have to auto-size it based off of what you go and see when reviewing, when... You review and then you make your sizes. Now there's a... Did we get the auto-sizing tool in this version? The, the branch line sizing? That's not out there yet. Okay. So we're looking, uh, we have it in the CAD side where you can grab a whole bunch of branch lines and say, this is my, this is my pipe sizing schedule. I want three pieces of inch and a half followed by two pieces of inch and a quarter, one inch, whatever you want, and the program will resize. We'll be bringing that into the Revit environment okay. probably this year. But, you, but in all cases, you, you modify the model, run a calc. Look at your results. I like it, I don't like it. What don't I like about it? Use the calc interface to decide what needs to be changed. Go back to the model, make the changes. If you're running calculations, you really only need to modify those pipes that are primary to the area you're calculating. So you might not have to resize an entire floor. You can resize these last three branch lines and the main back to the source run your calc, see what it looks like, say, okay, that's good. Now go size the rest of the, your branch lines. But we avoid auto-sizing things because the computer's never gonna see everything you see. It's just not possible. It's gonna make mistakes if, if we do it. And, you know, big corporation, we don't wanna be responsible for that. All right, they did, I didn't say that. Oh yeah, I did. Okay, it's still recording. Anything else? Ah. Any other questions? Hey, I thank you all very much. Uh, thank you.